Well, hello. Um, good afternoon. My name's Michael Ivers. I'm from the Bar Human Rights Committee of England and Wales, just beyond our southern border here. Uh, and what we do as a committee is uh, attempt to support uh, and help human rights defenders from around the world. And actually, very often those people are lawyers, uh, and they don't just get involved in the interpretation of concepts like uh, torture and inhuman and degrading treatment. Uh, they witness them firsthand because they're often the victims of them as well. Uh, and one country um, that we were and have been associated with for some a long period of time now is Zimbabwe, where we have met and encountered again and again extremely brave individuals, often lawyers, who have been at the forefront of fighting the worst violations of the government there and the never-ending uh, rule of Mr. Mugabe. And um, I'm pleased to say we have two uh, lawyers from Zimbabwe here at, uh, today with us to talk about um, events there and the history there, progress and lack of progress, etc. One of them is David Coulthard. Um, I met him, he had a brief spell of not being arrested and became the Minister of Culture when I was last there uh, four years ago. Um, but uh, again, on that occasion, I met personally many, many lawyers who were putting themselves actually at great risk just by meeting an international body who were talking about human rights. And it was extraordinarily humbling uh, to meet those individuals, many of them associated with David, who's now gone back to being a uh, lawyer. Uh, and we have Patina Guppa, I promise not to pronounce it Grappa. <laughs> And I've, uh, I've kept my promise. Uh, she's again a lawyer there. She's written two fantastic books. Um, and indeed, I heard some of the reading today. Uh, it was extraordinary. Uh, and some of it has a, 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 a legal background. Indeed, the first one concerns somebody who was in prison there. Um, so they're being moderated by Sir Kieran Prendergast. I remembered the knighthood. So I've done my job. And I'll hand over. <laughs> I would like to stress that I didn't ask him to remember the knighthood. Um, I took it for granted that uh, you would all remember the knighthood, um, as indeed I do on a nightly basis, um, however you want to spell nightly. Um, I love Zimbabwe. Um, I was part of um, uh, Lord Soames's, he was a lord, um, Christopher Soames's. Um, team during the transition to independence at the end of 1979 and the first months of 1980. I returned in 1989 to be uh, High Commissioner uh, when I was at the UN from uh, 97 to 2005. We took a big interest in, uh, in um, uh, Zimbabwe. We tried to observe uh, elections there. Once uh, Kofi Annan uh, had a conversation with uh, Mugabe on the phone where he thought that Mugabe had said uh, yes to um, UN electoral um, observation. I sent uh, two of our electoral experts there uh, who were frozen out. And when I passed through a few weeks later, I was told in no uncertain terms that, um, that the president's uh, recollection of the conversation with, um, with uh, Mr. Annan was not quite the same as Mr. Annan's. So we had to withdraw them. I, I, I do feel that it's a country that would need not that many changes to be, as some people used to say, God, God's own country. I should say, I don't have any history with Patina yet. We're just starting to establish one. But I've got some uh, history with, uh, with David. Uh, when I went there in 1989, even as long ago as then, when um, uh, ZANU-PF had 117 out of the 120 um, uh, uh, freely uh, elected seats in uh, in, uh, in, in Parliament, uh, I was advised to uh, invite David to uh, lunch tete-a-tete -tete because he was receiving undue attention from the, uh, from the uh, intelligence uh, uh, services and that um, if the British High Commission was paying him some attention, that might help him a bit. We gave some uh, equipment to, uh, what's it called, the Legal Resources Centre um, in, uh, in Harare, where I also met Mike Orette. Uh, another member of the um, Catholic Commission for Justice and Peace who was excoriated by Ian Smith and then um, for, his, um, for his sins excoriated by President uh, Mugabe as a, as a typical um, Africana Boer racist. Um, so he got it, if you like, both barrels from, uh, from the right um, and the left. 
in terms of, um, of uh, degrees of separation, one, uh, when I, re I, re I read uh, David's 603 page, is it? Um, 600 and something page uh, book on the Costa Brava a couple of weeks ago, I noticed that one of the inspirations for him to write it was someone called Mark uh, Muller-Stewart, um, who has some connection with this uh, event. Um, I noted that he was at Cape Town University with Andrew Ladley, uh, with whom I work a bit at the Center for Humanitarian uh, Dialogue, and also that um, he has a connection um, with Priscilla Hayner, um, who is uh, an expert on transitional justice. So we have, we have a, a, a bit of form. Um, we'll talk a bit about the books, but I, I think that with two such acute observers of Zimbabwe, we should also talk about um, the issues that, uh, that, that matter there. Um, uh, what sort of transition do they um, expect? You, put, you, you may or may not know that under the Constitution, uh, if Mugabe dies before the end of his term in 2018, then ZANU PF have the uh, have the right to, to to nominate the or to name the uh, the successor, but ZANU PF is uh, riven into uh, internal uh, strife. Um, uh, one or other of you might like to talk about who's going to to win or what sort of transition you will um, have. Um, we also, uh, I think, we might with um, uh, with advantage. Uh, talk about what you might call post-traumatic stress syndrome because you had the, the wrongs that were done during the liberation war. Uh, you had the wrongs that were done during Gukura Hundi, the emergency from 82 to 87 when many uh, Ndebele were uh, murdered and other people were murdered. And you have the wrongs that have been done since. And there has been no accounting for uh, any of this. And in my work at the United Nations, I formed the, the strong view that there was a, a, an issue which you might call unfinished business, that unless there is some form of uh, accounting and uh, reconciliation, real reconciliation, that this will fester on more or less um, in, uh, in, indefinitely. Now, um, what I know about Patina is that um, she's a citizen of the world now. She's a Zimbabwean from Harare, but she has degrees from all over the place. We poor chaps in the Foreign Office always feel rather underqualified when we um, meet people like Patina because in the Foreign Office you got a first degree and that was it. Um, and we were pretty distrustful of people wanting to join the Foreign Office with masters, let alone um, doctorates. And Patina has all three. Um, I think one from the University of Zimbabwe, a law degree from Cambridge, and a doctorate uh, from, uh, from, uh, from a university in, uh, in Austria. In Vienna, was it? Graz. Graz. Very good. Um, well, as you can see, um, uh, I can't compete with that, wouldn't want to, um, uh, but uh, it, uh, it means that she has, she's a Zimbabwean, but she has a perspective which is wider than just uh, Zim Zimbabwe. Um, can we um, start with the, um, with the transition, um, your views on what you think might um, uh, what form it might take, who might be the, uh, the winner. Um, uh, has Grace got a chance? We've been talking about women's rights, but I talked to um, an opposition ex-minister, not, not you, David, um, when I was in Zimbabwe in, uh, in April, and he said he believed that he, had, he personally had more chance of bearing a child than, than Grace had <laughs> of becoming the next um, uh, president. Was, was that over-optimistic or over-pessimistic in terms of women's rights? Do you know what? Uh, I think David should kick this off because I have a completely different perspective from any person that I've met and talked to. So I'm very, <laughs> I'm, very I'm very keen to hear what David has to say about this. Well, you know, um, we'll use every opportunity to plug the book. And in the final chapter of my <laughs> book, I, I speak about this. And I, I, I say that Grace's power, Grace being Robert Mugabe's wife, uh, operates in inverse proportion to Mc Mugabe's declining health. In other words, as Mugabe becomes more and more reliant on her, so her power grows. But the moment Mugabe dies, I think her power will evaporate overnight. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know? I'm so glad you say that because so many people are actually touting Grace as a real contender. She really isn't. She's a contender in the sense that she's being used by one of the factions. Basically, the first person 
who's going to know what happens to the president if he dies, and there's no assumption about that, he may, he may live forever, but <laughs> if he dies, the first person who will know is his wife. So the person who gets that news is in a really strong position to manipulate the Politburo, which is the main decision-making organ in the party. So that's why Grace matters. Grace matters because she is the person who is going to tell one of the two sides that this awful thing has happened. Now, the party, uh, the party is driven, as, as uh, Sakiran said, it's, it's uh, split into, at the moment, two groups. One is led by the vice president, Emerson Monangagwa, and the other, surprisingly, is led by the younger members of ZANU-PF. They call themselves, or they are called the G40, Generation 40. They're all young men in their 40s, 50s at the very latest. Now, what they don't have is what are called liberation struggle credentials. They don't have any history as having fought the, uh, the war against the whites, against the white settler regime. So the only thing they have is the power of crowd control. So all these protests that you see, um, rather not the protests, but the crowds coming out in support of Mugabe, they are all G40 organized because they don't have anything else. They don't have a constituency. They don't have the liberation struggle history. All they have is the, their power to, to command crowds. And that's what's so dangerous about that particular group. Because if that particular group takes over, we are going to see Zimbabwe become as populist as Hitler's Germany and Italy's Mussolini were through the power of crowds. And it's very easy to command crowds. We've got 89% formal unemployment. There are a lot of unemployed young men who all they have to do is to be promised a bottle of beer, a little bit of food, and they will take to the streets. That's the most dangerous aspect for me, this G40, um, uh, David, that you know, if, if they take over, then I think we are really in trouble. But at the same time, the other guys, Munangagwa, the vice president, the war veterans, they are just as scary in a different way. Well, it's also isn't it, a question of who controls the intelligence apparatus? I mean, to whom is the head of intelligence loyal? To whom is the head of the army loyal? Uh, to whom is the head of the uh, the police loyal? And I got the impression we, we were there. Well, you know, it's it's several months ago now, but um, uh, that Munangagwa had more of those sewn up than anyone other, maybe than Joyce Majuru, who isn't even a member of uh, mm. of ZANU PF. Well, that's the great danger. You know, two decades ago, uh, Judith Todd Garfield, Todd's daughter. Um, joked in response to a threat that there'd be a civil war. She said, if there's going to be a civil war in the country, it's going to be a very short one, because all the arms were in this homogenous unit, ZANU-PF, mm. uh, against an, uh, you know, an unarmed civil population, so it would have been a short civil war. The real danger in Zimbabwe now is that, as Patina says, Robert Mugabe's party is split, as we've never seen it split before. And it's not just split uh, within the political realm, but within the military, within the, the intelligence services. And you've got a, a three-way divide now. You've got Joyce Majuru, the former vice president, the wife of the uh, liberation commander of ZANA during the war, um, or the, rather the widow mm. who was murdered. Um, her husband was murdered. And there are people within the military who owe their allegiance to, to her. Then you've got... Uh, Emerson Minagagwa, the vice president, who probably commands majority support within the military at present. And then you've got Grace and this G40 group who also have some element of, of support within the military and security sector. But it means that we, in, in some respects, are at the, the most dangerous point in, in our history yep. since independence. And uh, the, the real danger is that there's going to be a bloodletting um, amongst these divergent groups within ZANU-PF. Where would you put the chances, the two of you? I mean, uh, peaceful transition, violent transition. 50-50, 60-40, 70-30, or what? Look, I mean, I don't think... Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be a violent transition. I think there's going to be some violence, yes. But I don't think we're facing civil war. I really don't. I, I agree with you, David, that... The danger is there. But I think one of the things that's unaccounted for is the external factors that might have an impact, like all these uh, demonstrations and riots that, that, that we're seeing. We don't know what ultimate impact they're going to have on the different factions. Are they going to make ZANU-PF unite? Are they going to split it even further? So there are all sorts of unknown factors 
the unknown knowns, as I think uh, Rumsfeld would call them, that may have an impact on whether we actually go into all-out civil war or not. Um, but for me, the most, uh, the most interesting aspect of all of this is how completely inept the vice president has been in fighting Mnangagwa. Mnangagwa in defending his turf. I mean, he has been completely clueless and he, he's been outplayed strategically by the younger guys because they have a lot of smart strategists. They might not have the, you know, the history of the party with them, but they have a lot of really smart people who are outmaneuvering him at almost every turn. So I think, th to me, the ultimate question of who is going to control ZANU-PF is going to come down to those two, either the G40 faction or the vice president's faction. But I'm not discounting that there may be other factors that could actually upset the whole thing. Uh, just to chip in quickly, I, I agree with Bettina. I think that there's little chance of a civil war you know, engulfing the entire country. I hmm. think the real danger is this battle within ZANU-PF. The contestation will be there. But having said that, this week, uh, if you've been following the Zimbabwe story, there have been burnings and yeah. protests in, in Harare, uh, and it's a powder keg at, at present. And, and mm -hmm. no one knows how that's going to unfold. You're a Bulawayo boy, so I need to ask you, uh, is Munangagwa acceptable to the Indabele? Is he acceptable in Matabili land? Again, maybe I don't know how much uh, the audience knows of Zimbabwe, but he was the Minister of National Security during this terrible Gukurahundi uh, campaign when there was massive repression of, uh, of Indabeli, and he has never said sorry. In a word, he, no. He, he, so what happens if he wins yeah. then? Uh, you've, um, got a, well, you've got a well, whole chunk the, of the country. That's alienated. the real danger about Manangagwe gaining the ascendancy because he, in my view, uh, he can only govern effectively through coercion. He cannot govern with the the will of the people. Yeah, I want to pick you up on that because I actually think that the best outcome for, because the G40 scared me, I won't lie to you, they, they, they scared the hell out of me because they are so organized, they are so ruthless, and as I said before, they're willing to use the power of the crowd. I actually think the best scenario for Zimbabwe would be if Munangagwa takes over within the framework that Sakiran has, has outlined. You know, if, if Mugabe dies, long may he live, if Mugabe dies, Mnangagwa takes over, right? And then we have to go to an election in, 20, in 2022 or whatever. And then Mnangagwa is defeated, 2018. Then Mnangagwa is defeated. Because Mnangagwa cannot win an election, as you say, and he cannot rule without coercion. Now, do you really think, David, that SADC, the AU, the UN, will allow Mnangagwa to steal an election in the way that they allowed Mugabe to steal an election? I don't think so. He doesn't have the charisma or the pulling power, frankly, of Mugabe. So I think the best outcome could be that he takes over within ZANU-PF, then we meet him at the election. And then, as you say, he's completely unacceptable in Matabili land. He's completely unacceptable in huge, huge parts of Mashona land. How many elections has he lost? And how many times has he had to be rescued? So I think the best outcome would be he takes over within ZANU-PF, and then we go to an election and Munangoga loses. That's the optimistic I scenario. Tell, I, want, I want to tell you a little anecdote tied, <laughs> tied to the book, but it illustrates the lack of support that Manangagwe has. In, in the book, I've quoted uh, extensively the statements made by Emerson Manangagwe way back in 1983 when he was involved in this crime against humanity, this genocide, and used inflammatory language. But when I wrote the book, uh, what I wrote was what I term fourth generation a fourth generation writing. Uh, the third generation was a human rights report produced in the 1990s. The second generation was uh, uh, the writing of um, Terence Ranger, uh, an Oxford don. But I'd never seen the original source, which was in the government-controlled newspapers. The book was published in March, and Emerson Munagagwa came out with a statement saying that what I'd written about what he'd said was false and mischievous, and that he was going to take unspecified action against me. That was released on a Tuesday night, and of course, you understand my anxiety. Mm. Because I'd never seen the original source, I was relying on what other people had, mm. had written. So I went to, to sleep somewhat nervously, but the next morning, uh, I woke up and went to Twitter, and the editor of the government-controlled paper, which had access to the source material, went down to his archives, photographed it, 
and put it on Twitter. <laughs> Instantly, you know, annihilating yep. any option that Manangagwa had to, to challenge me. But it does illustrate, even within government circles, he's disliked. Mm. Now, um, David has dropped several um, very elegant, very moderate, <laughs> but I would say unmistakable hints that we should be talking about his book a bit. Um, it's, he finally uh, got it. <laughs> I got it first time, but I thought there were one or two other things to talk about first. And we still need to talk about post-traumatic stress syndrome. I would say I, I read this, uh, this, this book um, uh, page to page uh, on the Costa Brava two, two weeks ago when we were ourselves in exile, uh, driven from our home by our own children, who would rather have house guests than us. Um, and I, first of all, I like there's still a sense of humor in, uh, in Zimbabwe. David's had to put up with a lot. But his, the title of his book is The Struggle Continues. Mm -hmm. And again, those of you who are familiar with Zimbabwe will know that during the Chimurenga, the, the arms struggle, their motto was taken from Portuguese, from, from uh, what happened in Mozambique, and it was um, a luta continua, the struggle continues. So David has now told me, when I reminded him of that, um, he said he's going to write another book, which is, which is the second part of the saying, which is uh, a vittoria e certa, Victory is certain, um, but you may have to wait a, bit, uh, 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 a little while. It is, uh, it is a long book. It's a detailed book, but for anybody interested in Zimbabwe, I think it is an indispensable um, uh, resource. Um, did, you, did, did, you use, uh, did you keep detailed notes all the time? Because you seem to have a, an extremely um, precise uh, recollection of what has happened at every... Uh, step along the way. And the other thing I was quite struck by was the number of times when you came quite close to death. Um, uh, either because people fiddled around, fiddled with the, um, uh, with the car, or um, you know, armed men were, were following you, uh, or, 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 um, or wherever. I mean, I think those are two, two of the things that most struck me on it. So did you keep, did you keep uh, detailed papers throughout your I did, uh, those of you who listened to Peter, uh, Peter's talk on Silk Road yesterday afternoon, he spoke about uh, how the genesis of, of his book was way back at university. And, and I, I wanted to write a book about my war experiences um, uh, way back in, in the early 1980s. And I wrote an outline then. And because I wanted to write that book, I was pretty meticulous in keeping the record. So, in the early 1980s, I represented as, a de as defense counsel many people who were the victims of the Gokurahundi, of the genocide. And whenever I had a, a, a very interesting case, I put it to, to one side and kept it. And on, at key moments, I didn't keep a, a detailed journal, but for example, when I met Nelson Mandela, I went straight home to my hotel room and spent two hours recording meticulously you know, every last word. So I, I, I had that record when it came to, to writing the book. Are you a very obstinate and difficult person? I mean, in the sense, uh, <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only asking because you have to be pretty obstinate to carry on doing what you're doing when you could have lived a comfortable life as a, as a, as a lawyer in a lovely uh, Bulawayo and not have, you know, you know your, your, your car sabotaged and, uh, you know, nuts uh, unscrewed and uh, be followed and harassed and charged and spent a lot of time uh, waiting for trials that either never happened or were strung out for forever. So would you, is that a fair description? Yeah, my wife would certainly agree with you um, that I'm an ob obstinate person. I'm sure it's my Scottish roots. I, I have that dour side to me. <laughs> oh, remind us, was it the de deputy provost of uh, My grandfather? grandfather of Edinburgh, and my father was born in Leith. Um, and, and, and are so you Remain? Are, are you separate? Are you independence or? <laughs> I, I value my health, so I will decline <laughs> to comment on that. <laughs> right. Anyway, it's, a, it's an extremely good book. Um, a rather different book is the Book of uh, Memory, which I've uh, started to read. I haven't finished it yet, but it's absolutely um, fascinating. Um, I was saying to Bettina, uh, Bettina earlier that, um, that our family has a certain connection with Chikarubi Prison, where the, the, the heroine is, um, is on, uh, is on uh, death row. Um, I better not ask you whether this comes from personal experience. Um, 
well, this is a bit awkward because I'm actually not really meant to be talking about the Book of Memory. I thought this session was all about David Coulthard, so I had come with a with a list of questions to grill him. Um, I'm, I'm in a very awkward stage because I finished publicizing the Book of Memory. We're waiting for the next book to come out in a month or so's time. It's called Rotten Row. So, and I've spoken about this book at 36 festivals, and I, I'm, I'm actually quite sick of the book, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I'm quite sick of the whole Chukurubi story. Um, but So if I may, I, I want to go back to something you said earlier, Sakir, and, and, and also what, um, what David said just now when he mentioned the Scottish roots. You talked about the unfinished business of uh, Gukuraundi, the liberation struggle, and the recent events. But there's another... UDI, UDI, yeah, UDI. exactly. There's another unfinished business, which is the crime of colonialism. And in Zimbabwe, it, it takes a very peculiar form. Because we should be angry with Britain, right? But we're not angry with Britain. Because Britain, at one point, decided they wanted to get rid of the African colonies. They were too expensive to run and all the rest of it. So Ian Smith and his band of merry men decided to take over the country and declared UDI. So our anger now is with the descendants, if you like, of Smith. The white people, the white Zimbabweans who are in Zimbabwe. And so now they have, to, they have been the bulwark against the British Empire. So our anger has been directed at the white minority. And the crime of colonialism is a real crime, right? We can talk about reparations if reparations need to be paid, but I think it's really, really important as we acknowledge all the crimes of Zimbabwe, we also acknowledge that initial crime of people coming to take land that wasn't theirs, uh, grazing over burial grounds, planting fields across you know, uh, cemeteries. And I, I worry, David, that there's a, and what I loved about your book, and this is the, the reason I, I gave it a blurb on the front cover, there's a searing honesty in the way you confront that past. And it's a searing honesty that's not often felt in, in the, what I call the white tribe of Zimbabwe, that somehow we seem to want to glaze over the war, we want to glaze over colonialism, we want to glaze over Chimoyo and Yazonia, all the pain that has led to horrible things like the land invasions. But I think the value, the chief value of your book, and the, the reason I'm so grateful for it, the reason I'm so grateful you wrote it, is this is a way to start talking in a very honest way about all those horrible things that have happened in our past. And, and, and so I imagine it must have been very difficult for you to write you know, the, the, the section in which you explained your own role in colonial Rhodesia. It, it was very difficult. The first seven chapters deal with that, that role. And when I did the, produce the first draft, I gave it to a very dear black Zimbabwean friend who himself is a, a, an ex-war veteran, a detainee of the Smith regime. And w when I wrote that first draft, I, I wrote as objectively as I could without too much reflection. And he was seriously disturbed by it when, mm. when he read that first draft. And, and he... He said to me, whilst I understand you, you were trying to be objective, I don't know that you, you're the per person I thought you were. Mm. And he encouraged me to be more reflective in those first seven chapters to, to illustrate that whilst I did certain things then and thought a certain way, I no longer think that. But it was important to, to say that. And even after I revised it um, following his comments, uh, he encouraged me to, to write almost a warning in the introduction. Mm. Mm. And it's a bit like, you know, on Sky Television, before they show flash photography, they, mm. they warn you. And, and that's the warning that I put in the introduction to say, especially to black Zimbabweans, you're going to find the first seven chapters very difficult, very hard to read because uh, white traditions white Rhodesians have a lot to answer for. Mm. We're very arrogant. And unfortunately, as Bettina said, there are far too many apologists in the white community for what happened. And they've almost been strengthened in their argument by what has by happened the in the last of 15 Zimbabwe. years. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And David, you know, we actually met for the first time six years ago, I think, at this festival. That's when I've met you for the first time. And I have to say, I read this book in manuscript and I was really, I was so shaken because you were not the person I... I recognize. So exactly as your, your I think it was Paul Tembanyati, mm -hmm. right? Exactly as Paul Tembanyati reacted to your book, I reacted in the same way, like, who is David Coulter? I don't recognize this man. And there's one particular incident that I still can't get out of my head, which is an incident in Chirezi in 1977, when you saw 
a body being thrown down a mine no, shaft. I, I participated. You participated in throwing a body down a mine shaft. Mm. And, and, and I wonder what, I can imagine what that must have done to you. But I wonder why afterwards you, you didn't go to find that person. Just to, for those, most of you obviously haven't read the book, um, all white Zimbabweans were conscripted during the, the war, and I was no exception. And in this particular incident, I was in the intelligence corps, and after contacts between Rhodesian forces and guerrillas, uh, dead guerrillas were brought back to, uh, ba to base camps, a bit like the Vietnam War. And because the Rhodesians didn't treat the war as a liberation struggle, mm. but as acts of terrorism, mm. each contact was treated as a crime. Right. And so we had to fingerprint and photograph dead guerrillas, and then we had to dispose of their bodies. And uh, the, the practice was, horrifyingly, mm. to throw, um, either to burn bodies or to throw them down mine shafts. And this was always done by subordinates, and, and I had to, on, on one occasion when I heard about this, mm. I decided, although I was an officer, that I needed to go with the subordinates. And it's plagued me. Mm. Um, you know, my wife, uh, we were in Bulawayo together last Sunday, and uh, I recognised only some time after, when I got married, how I was suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. Mm. I wasn't aware of it as a single person, but when I got married, for seven years after I'm, uh, we'd got married, I had nightmares. I would be waking up in the middle of the night and telling my wife to get under the bed. Mm. And tragically, I think a, a whole generation, a whole generation yeah. on both yeah. sides have been afflicted by this. And if you want to understand Zimbabwe today, you have to understand that history, that all those war veterans, unlike Vietnam, mm are still in the country. And they're running it. And they're running it. And they're untreated. Person, yeah. They're and untreated. You, but to get to the nub of your question, why have I not gone back? Mm. Uh, th that is, you know, a, a searingly difficult question mm. to answer. And there, there are a variety of reasons for that. I, funny enough, soon after getting back from university, I wanted to do that. And people said that I should not. Mm. Um, I... I believe not just in the context of the Liberation War, but certainly in the genocide which followed in, in the 1980s, that one of the reasons there is so much trauma in, in the country is because we have so much unfinished business. Yep. We've got these bodies lying from the Liberation War mm. and from the genocide of the 80s lying all over the country. And uh, we've never closed that, that chapter. And quite frankly, I don't think that we'll have real peace until we do that. And so just one final word. What I say in the book is my hope is that by writing uh, about it, and I find it incredibly difficult to, to write about. I, I mean, I was only 19 when that happened. Um, but it plagues one mm. your, your entire life. But we will only start to... Um, take the country forward when we start debating those things. Do you know, sorry to take over from you, Sekiran, it just struck me that you go, to every, <laughs> you go to every English village and every town and every city, and there's a public square somewhere where you have a war memorial to the glorious dead of the two world wars, right? You go to America, you've got Arlington National Cemetery, you've got memorials to the, to the Vietnam dead. Zimbabwe, there isn't a single war memorial anywhere to any dead of any war, apart from the Second World War. That is the last time we put up public memorials. We do not commemorate the dead from the Independence War on either side. We do not commemorate the dead from the Gukurawundi genocide, because obviously we can't afford to acknowledge it. And we do not acknowledge the dead from the recent um, you know, 2008 election. So you're absolutely right, David, that until we face that ugly, ugly, horrible history of violence, and death, we're, we're never going to be a free, free people. And that's why I really, I, I, I found it so difficult and uncomfortable to read your book, but I'm so grateful to you for writing it because I think this is the first time that we're actually hearing an honest account from the other side. It wasn't just an adventure, it wasn't a boy's own adventure do, 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 in the bush. It was a real thing and real people lost their lives. Just to internationalize this discussion, one of the things that terrifies me about the American election and Trump is that he's never experienced war. In mm. fact, he's glib about it. Yeah. And 
the, the main reason I'm so committed to nonviolence now is because I've experienced war and the, the, the horrors of war. And I've seen how elderly politicians are so willing to send gullible young men to fight their own battles. And that, uh, you know, when I see Trump's comments recently, how glib he is about the Purple Heart, uh, it terrifies me for the international community because he doesn't understand what war is, is all about. We needed a separate session on that, I suppose. Um, <laughs> There is more to say, I think, about, uh, I think Zimbabwe, I think Africa actually is an extraordinary continent because there, there is a considerably greater willingness to forgive or at least to get on with life than there is much nearer home. Uh, I mean, I dealt with Cyprus a lot and the number of casualties in, uh, in, in the two main convulsions in Cyprus is infinitesimal compared to what's happened in in a number of uh, African countries, but say in uh, Rwanda, they, st they still have to live together and they do live together. And if you think that uh, uh, the day after the elections in, Z in Zimbabwe, Ian Smith was free to uh, yeah. walk down the streets of Harare and would probably be greeted by, um, by his black fellow citizens rather politely and even cordially, um, to think that um, Mugabe kept on Ken Flower, the head of the Central Intelligence Organization to think that when Mnangagwa met the, um, the, 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 the staff of the Central Intelligence Organization, him being um, Minister of uh, National uh, Security, um, he kept them all. He didn't, um, he didn't fire them. There was a great degree of, um, of pragmatism. M my problem when I lived there was that there was a lack of self-awareness uh, with whites on issues like land. Oh. And I used to say to the commercial farmers, look, um, you own 4,000 families, own one quarter of the entire country, oh. and you own more than 90% of natural regions two and three, which yep, are the yes. ones which are for commercial farming, the valuable land. It is not tenable uh, long term for you to own um, nine tenths of the good farming land in Zimbabwe and a quarter of the entire country. Oh. Plus, do you, do you know that many of the, um, the, 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 the people in positions of influence had their parents pushed off this land uh, without any compensation um, at all. We were told when we went back in April, we have very good friends I used to play tennis with in, uh, in Harare, and they told me that uh, Joan and I were known either as the commies uh, or the pinkos. Um, <laughs> they did say that they have had to change a lot since then, but there was a lot to change. By the way, in terms of colonialism, let's not forget, um, in, in my former role as a British civil servant, that um, Britain gave self-rule to uh, Rhodesia in 1923. So they had 40 years to muck it up before um, before uh, uh, UDI. But, which but it was self-rule that didn't, that, that didn't include black people. It was self-rule for the uh, white oh, sure. minority. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And when yeah. Garfield Todd, as you, as you record, when Garfield Todd tried to move to a more li liberal dispensation, uh, he, was, he got the, um, he got the, the push. He got the job, so yeah. what, what, now what do we do about um, this, un, this unfinished business? I mean, what is the correct form of, um, of uh, truth-telling, uh, setting the record straight, ex exposing what has been done by both sides, because oh. some quite nasty things were, oh. uh, were done during the, the Chimurenga too. Um, but some of them were done by whites pretending to be black guerrillas. Um, uh, how, how do you deal with it? Um, I think you both said that the present government is not going to admit what they yeah. did in Gokura Hundi. Um, but until there is some a accounting and some accountability, okay. then and some uh, recompense, I suppose, even if it's only an apology, then this is going to simmer on, isn't it? Absolutely, and um, I, I was going to say, before you even mentioned truth-telling, I was going to you know, take your hand and follow you down the path down which you want to lead us. And I, I'm so glad you mentioned Rwanda in your previous remarks, because even more terrible things happened in the Rwandan genocide than has happened in the last uh, God knows how many years of Zimbabwe. But the reason the Rwandese are able to live together side by side is because firstly they had an open process in which people talked about what happened in that process. Then that process was supported by the international community in the form of the International Tribunal for, uh, for Rwanda. And then locally, the Gakaka courts uh, also operated to make sure that people saw justice operate at the local level. So there were these three processes that took place in Rwanda 
that meant that people were able to actually talk about, uh, about what happened to them. I mean, therapy is absolutely important. And I, I see these truth and reconciliation commissions as a kind of therapy, a kind of letting go. There's a beautiful, um, there are two beautiful words in Shona that mean forgiveness. The first one is kure gerera, which literally means to let go. The second one is kukanganwira, which means to forget. Right. So what we need is a process that will lead to Kukanganwira on both sides. And I'm talking about Kukanganwira from the war, from before the war. I'm talking about uh, the Gukura Hundi. I'm talking about the 2008 election and all the subsequent violence. There needs to be some kind of process where Zimbabweans are able to talk about what happened to them, even if it doesn't lead to actual prosecutions. You know, we just need to be able to actually talk and say, this is what happened. This is the ugliness that entered our hearts. This is the ugliness that entered our communities. And that's where we confront the ugliness of the past. Whether it will actually lead to any kind of legal prosecutions, I don't know. And I don't know that's the best uh, possibility uh, or outcome for Zimbabwe. But I think at the very least, there needs to be that, what you call the truth telling. David? I share that. I think one of the great tragedies of Zimbabwe is that we have a culture of impunity mm. which is deeply embedded in our political uh, system. And it goes way back to Lancaster House. Both Smith and Mugabe didn't want any truth-telling. Mm. The, there was a consensus, unlike de Klerk and Mandela, who agreed on a truth-telling. Uh, both our leaders were adamant that they didn't want to, to do that. That was then compounded by the international community before you became High Commissioner, which looked the other way when the genocide happened. I think the, the international community was so focused on the Cold War and on uh, encouraging white South Africans to embrace the end of apartheid that they covered up the genocide, which fostered that culture of impunity. And the only way really we can resolve all of, the, of this unfinished business is by going back to 1965. It, it's the, the date when Smith declared UDI. It would involve the whites so that the white community face up to their role mm. in the militarization of society, in the, vulture, in the violence which followed that. And then, of course, we've got to look at the genocide of the, the 1980s and also Murama Tsvina, which we haven't touched on, the d destruction mm. of urban dwellings that arguably killed more people than yes. both the war and the genocide because of the combination of poverty, the destruction of homes, uh, uh, and, the, and AIDS, of mm. course. Mm. Uh, when we do that, and it's got to be victim-orientated, people have to be given an opportunity to say what happened to them, and then we can perhaps start healing the country. Mm. We've only got five minutes, and so unfortunately we can't get into the, um, the aspect of this, which is victor's justice, and that is always the, the danger, and you see around the world starting in Nuremberg, I suppose. Uh, Victor's justice is the, um, is the norm. I'm, I'm told we have five minutes, so um, uh, we will have uh, one or two very, very fast questions. Um, Madam, I think you were first with a pink cardigan. Thank you very much for that presentation. I, I spent some time in Zimbabwe and uh, working occasionally, uh, and I found it such a beautiful place. It was really sad when things went so wrong. But my question is, and I think you alluded to this, w would, would the situation have been any different if Thatcher had followed through with the promise at Lancaster House of land re recompense for, la for the land? Well, she did. I mean, this is the, this is the trouble with, um, uh, with, uh, with, with history. Um, when I was High Commissioner, my first meeting with Mugabe, I said that we would make considerable extra uh, funds available but only on the basis of willing, selling, willing seller, willing buyer, and also that there was proper redevelopment. In other words, that the land went to those most in need. Uh, the, the, the actual co land element of a proper redevelopment scheme is, is less than one third, because you have to have training, you have to have equipment, you have to have infrastructure, and there was a doctrinal objection on the other side, which I personally understood, um, uh, about, about going down the willing seller, willing buyer route even though there was lots of land available. But then there was a catastrophic letter from uh, Claire Short when Labour took over. Uh, like me, she is of an Irish background, um, but she said that um, I don't feel any post-colonial guilt because I'm Irish and uh, we had our land taken away and we got on with it, so you get on with it too. 
Um, and again, it's a paradox, by the way, if I may talk about international relations, that left-wing governments in Africa very often get on better with right-wing governments in, uh, in England, uh, in Britain, than they do with uh, left-wing. Relations between the South African government and the Labour government were much more difficult than uh, with the, the Tory government. Now, two quick questions. Now, Mr. <laughs> Muller, I suppose you have the droit de seigneur. Oh, no. Uh, okay. uh, I, I, I'll just answer that very quickly, if I may. Uh, I, I don't entirely agree with Zakirin's view on this because to, he no. was an insider as well. But I'll just say this. Land was a convenient grievance. Huh? Yeah. And no matter what would have happened, it is very likely that it would have continued to be a convenient grievance for ZANU-PF to get to where it is. But at the same winner. time, on the other side, I always say to people who tell me here in this country, oh, African colonialism, it's all in the past. Your past is our present. So that land inequity is still felt today. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask a question about uh, lack of Western support for uh, the MDC and also um, the struggle for democracy. I was the chair of the Bar Human Rights Committee for many, many years, and David and I have worked together for the last 15, 16 years. Um, and I may say, I think David and I've no, worked No, a quick with, question, please. No, but if I may... No, uh, <laughs> No, if I may, if I may, Kieran, because actually this is quite important. Uh, I, I've uh, worked with many human rights lawyers around the world. I think David is one of the most honest, most compelling human rights lawyers that I have ever ever met in my life, and I would just want to say that. But secondly, it is incredibly difficult from being a human rights lawyer who have advocated for victims of human rights abuses to then move into government and sign a global political agreement. And David in 2009 did that and actually had to sit down, if you like, with his nemesis. And I remember in 2010 when you were here and we were dealing with a new coalition government and you were turning around and saying the global political agreement is the only way forward at that stage and you were beginning to put books into classrooms and everything else. And we took that three-hour journey from here just over to Ayrshire to try and convince the Scottish Cricket Association to turn up to Zimbabwe just to give uh, Mugabe a sense that the political agreement had dividends. And the Tory government, in the end, turned against you. Mm. So my question is this. I remember Blair turning around and prescribing virtually every organization that advocated uh, violence uh, to, uh, to, uh, to achieve political ends. Zimbabwe was the classic example of a non-violent movement, and yet actually was allowed to simply you know, wither on the wine. How much do you think that the West has a responsibility in relation to what happened in Zimbabwe in the subsequent election? I once did a, a debate on this topic at Intelligence Squared in London, um, and I had to argue that the West wasn't responsible, so I'm going to give that <laughs> the, the other side to the debate <laughs> now. No, I think that the, the, the international community shares a lot of re responsibility. It's not only the international community. Uh, you know, the fact is that UDI was a, a shocking uh, m mistake. Uh, the RF policies were indefensible. They caused, they radicalized black nationalists. They caused a war. They, they caused the militariz militarization. You can't blame that on the West. And Mugabe committed a genocide. But where I do blame the West is that uh, they didn't hold Mugabe accountable. Br Britain gave Mugabe a knighthood, knighthood yep. when they knew that he was responsible for a genocide. And that created in him, his mind a sense of impunity. And even... Uh, in more recent times, when we had this option of a peaceful transition, uh, the, the West, although it helped in some respects, didn't give it complete support. For example, sanctions were not li lifted. When people like I, I was on, on hard talk in, on the BBC, you can't get a more public venue than, than that, calling for the lifting of sanctions. I've been a human rights lawyer for, for three decades, and the Conservative Party listened to a small clique of right-wing people in Britain, domestic opinion in Britain, and ignored what we were saying. And that the non-lifting of sanctions allowed Mugabe not to fulfill other 
terms of the global po political agreement, which in turn led to him being able to manipulate the election in 2013 and to retard the entire process. And, and we have burning in Harare again. Um, so we are responsible as Zimbabweans, but the West does need to listen more to people on the ground. The OAU could have done more, in my opinion. Um, yep. Sadek could have done more. Um, my main, the only criticism I have of your book is the, or of MDC really, is the decision by Shangirai to withdraw from the second round of the presidential election, having won the first round. It was, it was, it was seemed clear to me that if he, if he had stayed on, he would have, he would have won, and he would have won handsomely. Now, in your book, you spell out the amount of violence that was going on. Um, uh, but, but, and that was intolerable, therefore he withdrew. If I'd been in his position, if I'd been in your position, I would have said, unless the African Union and SADC bring this under control, I will have to withdraw. And you would have had leverage. But as it was, withdrawing just left the, the field to... But, but it's made that government illegitimate. It, it completely took away the legitimacy of that result. No one recognized that result. And it's what actually led to the unity government. And it's what led to David Coulthard over five years putting books in classrooms. And we've said a lot of things about the wonderful work that Colt, David Coulthard has done as a human rights advocate um, and as a, as a lawyer. But I think the most, his lasting impact will be what he did as Minister of Education because you cannot replicate what he did. Those five years gave hope to the children of Zimbabwe, brought books to their classrooms, and none of that would have happened if Changirai had not actually withdrawn from that election, leading to a unity government, leading to a bit of respite for the first time in more than a decade of crisis. So it's, it's very easy, I think, to sit back and say, oh, I would have done this, I would have done that. But the reality is it was such a tough decision for him to make. I am by no means Jangirai's biggest fan. In fact, I can't stand the man, to be frank. But that's one of the few acts of bravery that, that he actually uh, undertook. And for, for, for that, I think we really should be very grateful to not only Morgan Jangirai, but to, to David Coulter and all the members of the MDC who joined that unity government. And I was one of the people who said, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this. I will admit publicly, David, I was wrong. But uh, that, is <laughs> a, that is an excellent note on which to end, unless you want to have the last well, word, just, David. No, I think we're the, both MDCs, not just Morgan Sangarais, our MDC, because I was in the smaller faction, where we're more culpable was not so much in 2008, but, but in 2013, mm, exactly. where we yeah. were disunited and where the conditions for the election were so subverted that we should, had we been more united and not yeah. feared that the other party would contest, we yeah. should have both withdrawn yeah. and left Mugabe to his own devices. We participated in the, this fraudulent process and handed the baton stick exactly. back to Mugabe and created this terrible situation that Zimbabwe finds Surely itself Surely you mean the button now. stick. The button <laughs> stick. <laughs> uh, sorry, can I just say one last thing? Uh, if there's any justice in the world, Leonardo DiCaprio, with his Rhodesian accent, will call David's uh, agent, Judy, and say we want to make a movie called The Struggle Continues, <laughs> dude. Um, <laughs> Because I'm sure you saw DiCaprio in Blood Diamond with his very dodgy, roadie accent. Uh, I, think, I think DiCaprio would make a very good David Coulthard. <laughs> so if any of you have any Hollywood contacts, <laughs> please get him to call. But more importantly, please, please, please buy this book. David brought a gazillion copies from Bulawayo because he doesn't yet have a UK distributor. And we don't want him to take those copies back home. <laughs> so please buy the book and David will sign them. That's a very good note on which to end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. By the way.